History is full of facts, while life is full of hopes. Hope, so it was for Astoria, Oregon, when the 1940 census found that fewer than 25,000 people still lived on the shores of this sleepy little fishing village. The 1920s had been a boom for the town, but the Great Depression of the 30s had been a bust. There had been a time when Astoria was the largest bustling American city west of the Rocky Mountains, but that time was now long gone. This boom and bust economy was not uncommon for this historical little city. The residents had lived it many times, and through it all, they had survived. God had blessed Astoria with breathtaking beauty, a river full of fish, forests filled with trees, and a location right at the doorstep to the Pacific. But surviving this unforgiving Garden of Eden was not an easy task. Mother Nature had also provided one of the wettest environments in the world, with storms and seas that curled the toes of any sea captain that dared journey into the estuary of the mighty Columbia River. The world was at Astoria's front door, but crossing that threshold was always a life and death struggle. The town had a rich history that reflected the many influences of the people and cultures from around the world. Many of the residents were the direct descendants of the sailors, fur traders, adventurers, and immigrants that settled the area over the last century. There were Finns, Danes, Swedes, and Norwegians, mixed in with Asian, European, and native breeds, that were all called Astorians. These were hardy folks who worked with the bronze of their backs, the strengths of their hands, and had dirt under their fingernails. These Astorians clung to their family, faith, work, and their love for their new country. America was their land of opportunity. By the end of the decade, with the Great Depression circling the drain, the Astorians looked to the skies and hoped for prosperity, but instead found only the dark shroud of war clouds hanging over their community. Then, like a boil that needs lancing, came the day of infamy, December 7, 1941, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. America was at war and Astoria would never be the same. Their day of awakening had arrived. In the dark early days of World War II, my family moved to the North Coast. I was just a young'un new to long pants at the time and had many heroes. They included Roy Rogers and Gene Autry, of course. But my biggest heroes were the brave and bold Navy pilots that I watched working with my father at the Astoria Naval Air Station. That's what I wanted to be, a pilot. A Navy pilot. Astoria, Oregon, played a pivotal role in helping America win the war. This bustling little community on the shores of the Columbia River helped contribute a fleet of over 500 ships and thousands of planes, pilots, and sailors to the war effort. Shortly before America entered the war in 1940, a man by the name of Henry J. Kaiser secured a contract to build 31 cargo ships for the British government. The Brits were in a bad way, standing alone as they fought the Nazis in Europe. They needed help, and the American government was beginning to provide them with the much-needed war materials. 
Kaiser was a genius of a man with a worldwide reputation as a can-do industrialist. He had recently completed the Hoover Dam, finishing the project in half the time and under budget. If you needed something big done, Kaiser was your man. With the British contract in hand, Kaiser searched the communities of the West Coast for the best locations to build the shipyards. The sites had to be on a navigable waterway with a large local workforce and a good transportation system. In addition, the locations had to have access to cheap energy as his shipyards would run 24 hours a day. His first selection was 90 miles upstream from Astoria next to Portland, Oregon. This thriving community was called Vanport and it offered low price hydropower and had a large population nearby with excellent rail connections. As the shipyards were being built, Kaiser and his nautical engineers designed the first Liberty ship. Their concept was simple, make the ships durable, inexpensive, and easy to build. During the course of World War II, 18 American shipyards would build 2,710 Liberty ships using the Kaiser design. On May 19, 1941, Kaiser's Oregon Shipbuilding Corporation launched their very first Liberty ship, the Star of Oregon. However, of the first five ships built that year, all were sunk in action within months of their commissioning. England was losing the war, but she still clung to hope. After the surprise attack by the Japanese, America entered World War II and the entire country was mobilized for the war effort. On the home front, all the lighthouses on the west coast were darkened, all except the Tillamook Rock Lighthouse, which stayed lit to guide the maritime fleet being built upriver. As Kaiser constructed another shipyard across the river in Vancouver, Washington, he and his engineers designed a new type of aircraft carrier that would become known as the Casablanca class escort carrier or CVE. These baby flat tops would be built using the standard hull of a Liberty ship with a flight deck on top. These smaller carriers would be used for convoy duty and to resupply the larger fleet aircraft carriers with planes and crews. The concept was again simple and easy to build. Within months of finishing the plans, Kaiser had a U.S. Navy contract to build 50 such ships. During the war, Kaiser also expanded his operations in Oregon and built more Liberty ships, landing craft, and T-2 tankers for the U.S. Maritime Commission. Aircraft carriers need planes and crews, and that's where Astoria came in. The Navy already had a naval air station on Tongue Point, just east of town where PBY Catalina seaplanes arrived for coastal patrols and anti-submarine operations. In addition, Astoria had a good-sized municipal airport with room to grow, and the Navy welcomed the town's deep water location so near the mouth of the Columbia River. Best of all, the entire estuary was protected by the 249th Coast Artillery. 
Fort Columbia and Fort Camby stood on the north side of the river, with Fort Stevens on the south shore. This iron triangle of defenses made Astoria an unapproachable fortress. My grandfather, Harry Braddy, had worked for many years for the Coast Guard maintaining lighthouses up and down the coast. In 1940, he became the head of civilian construction at the Tongue Point Naval Air Station. He and his crews built barracks, chow halls, shops, movie theaters, and administrative buildings. Prior to the start of the war, my father, Dudley Raddy, did the same kind of work for the Army up in Alaska. After the war started, Grandfather got my father a job with the Navy as a civilian carpenter. Dad soon became the head of construction for the Astoria Naval Air Station. All seemed peaceful with all their construction projects until with the loud rumble of an incoming bombardment in June of 1942, a Japanese submarine surfaced about six miles out to sea and lobbed 17 shells at Fort Stevens. While the attack caused no real damage, it represented a wake-up call to the local residents that the war was very real and Fort Stevens had just become the first mainland U.S. military base to be attacked by a foreign power since the War of 1812. The primary mission of the Astoria Naval Air Station was to train Navy pilots and the crews on the new types of combat planes that would serve on the escort carriers. They would also instruct the pilots on short field landings and takeoffs in preparations for the small decks of these baby flat tops. The airport runways were lengthened, new ones were added, and hangars were built to handle the flood of arriving aircraft. New planes arrived every day from the aircraft manufacturers up and down the west coast. Each escort carrier required a minimum of 28 planes. Soon, the gray skies around the airfield filled with all types of aircraft. Grumman F-4F Wildcat fighters, the Avenger torpedo bombers, the Douglas SPD dive bombers, and from Tongue Point, more Catalina flying boats. As the pilots and crews trained, there were many accidents. Some planes went down during their training flights, while others crashed upon landing or, as my father told me years later, some pilots undershot the runway and ditched in the shallow, muddy waters of Young's Bay. This was a dangerous business with young, inexperienced pilots at the controls. God bless the courage and determination of these fine young men. On the home front, the tiny Astoria Railroad Station filled with strange faces and voices from all around America. Sailors for the ships and pilots for the planes. These men and women had different accents, uniforms, and lifestyles. They filled the quiet streets, bars, shops, and waterfront, turning Astoria into a more diverse crab pot. The local children collected scrap iron, old tires, and newspapers for the war effort, while their parents bought war bonds and held rallies in support of the troops. There was rationing of everything. Food, gas, 
rubber, and scrap metal. And as the local men marched off to war, the local women stepped forward, taking over their jobs. There were women fishermen, lumberjacks, bartenders, and auto mechanics. While Portland had Rosie the Riveter, Astoria boasted the amazing and resourceful Daughters of the Columbia. Everyone pulled together for one common cause, the war effort. After the escort carriers were completed in Vancouver, they steamed to Astoria for sea trials across the Columbia Bar. If the carriers performed to the high standards set by the many Navy supervisors, the ship would be commissioned into the fleet. Once this was accomplished, the carry would sail again for the open seas and wait for her aircraft and flight crews to arrive from the Astoria NSA. This marrying of ships and planes on the open ocean was a very dangerous time for the untested pilots. Some had trouble landing on the small, twisting flight decks, while others overshot the deck and crashed into the cold sea. Carrier pilots had to have nerves of steel. Finally, with all the planes recovered, the escort carrier, with a complement of just over 900 officers and men, would steam towards their first combat assignment. These newly commissioned ships would soon join the Pacific Fleet, which was the largest naval armada the world had ever seen. This massive strike force would soon annihilate the Japanese fleet and bypass or destroy the Imperial Japanese Army. In less than two years, Kaiser built and delivered all 50 escort carriers to the U.S. Navy. At the end of the war, America had lost 12 aircraft carriers to enemy action. Five of those sunk were CBEs built on the shores of the Columbia River. Unfortunately, today not one of these ships have survived the years. They were all scrapped at the end of the war. The war in Europe ended with the surrender of Nazi Germany in the spring of 1945, while victory over Imperial Japan came in August of the same year. The entire world celebrated the end of the war. It was a time for tears of joy and hopes for a future of peace and prosperity. Let the parties begin. Faith, resolve, and sacrifice is how Astoria, Oregon, and hundreds of other small communities across our nation help win World War II. America always stands the tallest when we stand together. I never did become a Navy pilot but I served in the Oregon Air National Guard as a photo reconnaissance photographer. Today, with my chin whiskers gray and my hair snow white, I realize that my early heroes should have included all of the men and women, in and out of uniform, who helped defeat the tyranny of our enemies. They preserved our freedoms and our American way of life. August the 15th, 2020 is the 75th anniversary of VJ Day and the end of World War II. So many gave so much. As we pay tribute to America's greatest generation, let us never forget that we share our tomorrows because of their yesterdays.
the war years through a bloody lens is the winner of the Eric Hoffer Literary Award and the Book of the Year Award. This story is as fresh as today's headlines and as true as yesterday's sins. Don't miss this tribute to the so many that gave so much and help us celebrate the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Hats off and a deep bow to the greatest generation that ever lived. For more information, DutchClark.com.